Okay, it's midnight. I just had an apple and a coffee simultaneously. Let's do this. I want to briefly talk about Method's recent stream of the Battle of Tardalor raid in World of Warcraft. The raiding guild and esports organization Method streamed their week-long attempts to be the first guild in the world to clear the raid on its highest difficulty. They defeated the boss and the stream was a huge success. We're going to be talking about what this means for both Method and the raiding scene as a whole. You will see a lot of these videos in the coming days, as pundits try to answer the questions of what happened and what comes next. I will attempt to spare you from that and just give you the correct answers now. Method's stream was almost certainly a massive success for them, but its implications for the competitive scene are a little more complex. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, let's cover the basics. Raiding is a format of World of Warcraft's instanced environments that pits upwards of 40 individuals against massive opposition. It's sought to evoke the fantasy of invading a dragon's lair with 40 adventurers to plunder it for stolen loot. Raiding has always been an exercise in commitment and endurance above all else. Raiding in vanilla entailed hours of preparation to gather consumables and maintain your character in order to spend hours in a raid for little tangible reward. Raiding was inaccessible to most people, and while the world first kills were recorded throughout vanilla, turn of the millennium internet meant that most people weren't online enough to care who killed the boss first. There was never a tangible reward for world first boss kills. Rewards would be added for a first kill on a given server, but the support was never there to reward people for accomplishing something on a global scale. Progression rating at its highest intensity has always been an exercise in ego. This attracts people whose ego means that much to them, and when the stakes are that high, those individuals can be incredibly toxic. Progression rating is not what most people would associate with fun. By Sunwell, the world first kill was elevated to the prestige of Brief Aside on World of Warcraft podcast. It wasn't until Insidia's world first Algalon kill in 2009 that I personally sat up and really took notice of a world first kill. This was also the first world first kill video to be uploaded to YouTube in high definition, thus giving the viewer a reasonable shot at decoding the visual noise of what was going on. It also helps that Algalon as an encounter was pretty rad. It was around this point that there was a shift in the dichotomy of WoW's boss design. Wrath of the Lich King saw us move away from static and rhythmic fights like Illidari Council to fights like the Iron Council, with its changing phases and organic difficulty setting. Some stuff became easier, but most of it became much harder. The new age and competitive rating would be solidified with Heroic Lich King the following year. The Lich King encountered to find what rating would be for the next decade. The fight was gruelling with punishing, often overlapping mechanics, and an enraged timer that hung over your head like a sword of Damocles. Heroic Lich King would see Cataclysm's launch be arguably the most competitive race we'd ever see. This momentum would be carried into Heroic Firelands before Ragnaros would put an end to it. Many guilds that had established themselves in the last two years disbanded in front of Heroic Ragnaros. It was almost certainly the hardest raid encounter Blizzard ever shipped, and though many people were into it, for some it highlighted that there is a breaking point when it comes to difficult raid content. After the wet fart that was Dragon Soul, competitive raiding would never regain that lost momentum. It would fall into routine and only really be enjoyed by its very core user base. This mirrors World of Warcraft's trajectory on the whole. By 2012, World of Warcraft had passed through the mainstream consciousness. It would continue to be a financial success and be good, but for the most part, the game would come to rely on retaining users rather than gaining new ones. Traditionally, progression raiding was an insular experience. Defeating a raid boss is akin to solving a puzzle. So if you're doing competitive puzzle solving, you're gonna keep your ideas and solutions away from your competition. This became seen as a core feature of the experience of competitive raiding, often taking the form of dumb controversies on when an acceptable time was to post a video of your boss kill. All of this was done to add some form of validity to the race, that a guild that came third had solved the problem themselves, and not just crib notes off the people that came first. In an era where esports was exploding, World of Warcraft raiding failed to capture an audience. That is because ultimately, under this regime, there was nothing to see. You would see a kill video of the winning guild potentially weeks after they killed the boss. It would often do well, but it would end there. Raiding had no monetization pathway. In terms of ad revenue, if you got the world first kill, you could assume your video would do well, but that's a single video. It could never pay 30 odd people's wages for even the time spent working on the boss, much less some form of salary. The closest thing I ever saw to sponsorship was a free license to a tunneling service I can't even remember the name of. As a result, competitive rating remained in the amateur and hobbyist space, a place where you could be good at something by simply being willing to do it, like being the best at deep-throating a cricket bat. Because World of Warcraft now struggles to bring in new players, the number of new players entering the pool of competitive rating has been close to nil. Instead, as players have left, guilds have been collapsing and the player base congregating into an ever smaller number of guilds. After Legion, it seemed reasonable to assume that World of Warcraft's rating was going to just peter out in a nice exponential decay. All of this changed with this week. Methods broadcast of their progression has had far more impact on the future of WoW's rating than is immediately apparent. So now we can finally talk about the Red Bull gaming sphere. 
Red Bull Gaming Sphere is a so-called public game studio based out of London. Unlike most esports studios you may be familiar with, it does not exist to house a singular event or owned by a singular broadcaster. The purpose of the studio is to provide an avenue for niche events to obtain the production values normally reserved for official esports events. In short, the space is rented out for temporary use by streamers and esports organisers. If you watch the stream, you could be forgiven for thinking that this was ultimately still an amateur production. But make no mistake, the decision to have Method Raid and stream out of the studio was absolutely not cheap. The camera used to capture the panel is an Ursa Mini Pro, a cinema camera valued at 6,000 US dollars. Do you think this guy was in charge of that? No, the back end of the gaming sphere looks like this. Red Bull almost certainly staffs the venue with their own production crew, whose wages will be paid as part of the expenses. They were broadcasting live for upwards of 16 hours a day for a week straight. Their commentary team was comprised of individuals from all over the world. Rich Campbell is based in New York, but was present on the panel throughout the length of the broadcast. Likewise, Alan Widman is based in Germany. Discounting the probability that these guys are working for exposure, the cost of flights and accommodations needs to be accounted for. Either Rich was offered enough to make those expenses palatable, or more likely, Method covered his travel expenses as part of the deal they cut. Likewise, I imagine a commute home at 2.30am was not the interest of Method's Raiders. It is safe to speculate that Method paid for nearby accommodation for participating players. But yeah, in the hotel guys. I'm gonna head to Red Bull, meet the guys. And On a similar note, there was a constant stream of food being delivered to ensure players and panel were fed and comfortable. This results in a far higher catering budget than just some dude making sandwiches in the console area. The point of all this is to put in perspective the difference between an amateur production that normally defines a streamer like Sko at his home and scope of this production. It is night and day. Method as an esports organization invested real capital into this event. And judging by the numbers it pulled, it's safe to say it was a success. When I recorded these clips a little over an hour before Jaina died, the total viewership was something like 140,000 people. Again, just for perspective, 25,000 viewers on HBOM's charity stream was enough to get a sitting member of US Congress to join the call to discuss policy. AGDQ's 2018 viewership topped at 223,000 viewers, a charity that raises millions of dollars per an event. There is no point in speculating on a figure because the money is on screen. The Method stream was a success on a scale that only professional productions can be. With this event, Method has finally found a way to monetize rating in a capacity that can actually reflect the time invested into it. The word professional raider is now a thing that exists. The progression race itself acts as a windfall and a means of cultivating the audiences of individual raiders. I can't find much solid information on what, if anything, Method pays its raiders. I've heard they receive some form of salary, but I honestly don't know. Based on my understanding, it seems like cultivating streaming careers for individuals is the more practical way of method feeding its players. The mere existence of the stream is more meaningful to World of Warcraft than its contents. Had method lost the race, they'd have still generated more than enough revenue to justify continuing the process into the future. I honestly didn't find the stream that entertaining, but that didn't stop me from watching it for hours in the background. I imagine that is how most people engaged with it. Method's approach to rating was not at all performative. They made no changes to their usual routine in order to accommodate the stream. This meant sitting around with commentators needing to fill dead air for hours at a time. The commentary team wasn't given a line to Method's comms, so they had no clue what was going on in regard to strategy or composition, short of pulling a player aside and asking them. This made for commentary that was comparable to someone casting a restream of it on their own channel. A bit like when Asmogol bootlegs other people's content, but don't tell them I said that. With Method being the only guild being open about their progress, it meant literally hours of baseless speculation on where competing guilds were on the fight. But again, I watched it long enough to put forth these criticisms. Something about it worked for me, and it worked for tens of thousands of people. In spite of rating being as niche an activity as it's ever been, and producing a kind of shitty end product, Method achieved something they'd been pursuing for years. A way to make money from all this nonsense. Guilds like Limit, who have been keeping their progress under wraps, are going to be seriously tempted to begin streaming their own progress. I expect to see old names like Kungan make comebacks with an appeal to this idea of a raiding renaissance. The problem with that is that a great number of guilds are already streaming. I'd say around half the current top 15 guilds have streamed their progress this tier, and most only saw a fraction of the numbers Method pulled. No, I think what we saw over this last week is Method monopolising competitive raiding. The amount of WoW viewers on Twitch is finite, and a burst of new actors is more likely to fragment the viewership than generate new ones. Watching a highlight of Method Josh's post-raid debrief, Josh discussed the process Method went through for their heroic week preparations. The project was a massive undertaking that involved 6 split clears, 75 dungeon clears per player, and over 100 million gold loans to pay for materials to be transferred from different servers. This is a level of commitment that can only be accomplished as a full-time job. 
I saw a streamer who I've since forgotten dunking on limit for faction changing for the Darkshore case. I can't remember if he was from Method or not, but that statement is now laughable given what we now know about Method. With so much capital now in play for Method, a lot of behaviour that was once decried is now just common sense. Race changing to optimise for a boss was once considered desperate or shitty, investing real money into winning in video games. But for Method, it is a business expense. Having their entire raid changed to troll is the same cost as their lunchtime catering budget. Method's raid team remaining top dog is ultimately the core of its brand at this point. The stream may have been titled Race to World First, but do not let a bipartisan title like that distract you from what we were all there for. They were not providing coverage of the race so much as they were documenting Method's stroll to the finish line. And now, they have a monetization pathway that cannot be matched. If Limit were to start streaming, they wouldn't pull Method's numbers they'd pull wildcards numbers. Maybe limit streams, maybe they don't, maybe they disband. It ultimately doesn't matter because they will always be also rans. Whether it be Blood Legion, Limit or Wildcard, the idea of them being able to beat Method under these circumstances seems ludicrous, streaming or otherwise. If anything, Method benefits from the status quo, where the opposition remains this ethereal abstract opponent whose progress is never known. Hypothetically, there is the possibility of Blizzard getting involved and trying to monetize the race for themselves, perhaps establishing some form of moderated league, perhaps offering true coverage of the race involving numerous guilds. They've shown an interest in cultivating WoW PvE into some form of esport, as has been demonstrated with the MDI. The keystones remain infinitely more appropriate to traditional esports than progression rating. Any action from Blizzard would be essentially seeking to grift power away from Method the organization at this point, and the question becomes, what incentive would Method have to play along? They've demonstrated that they don't need Blizzard to succeed in this field, they know because they created it. I could ramble on for an hour about tangential shit, but I promised myself I would get this made today, and it's now well past midnight, so I need to wrap up. Ultimately, everything I spoke about does not matter, and that is why this is a half-assed video. I am impressed by what Method accomplished, not outraged. I just find it fascinating that in an age where Warcraft has as little cultural presence as ever, in an expansion that is being dunked on as awful, the audience was there on a scale I don't think anyone would have predicted. In a 2017 interview, Sko put forth the possibility of Method working with partners to reward top finishers of the race, essentially trying to engineer competition. They have known for some time now that monetizing the world's first race was possible, and now they are in a position to carry that forward. The challenge Method face going forward is to avoid betraying themselves as a behemoth crushing competition on a scale no one else can compete with. They will do precisely that, but they need to apply a delicate touch.